Bimela mbana besu, ndoza kuti mbana banta te mudimu, mudimu wa abirame isaka li ya kubi. Usoni nina nini, humtali wendo zonge mutodi wa mahudimu dele fati. Greetings to all the Bantu in Southern Africa, in all of Africa, and in all the four corners of the earth. Thank you for all your messages, brothers and sisters, especially your messages of support from all of you. I know it takes a while to work on videos with time being the greatest enemy. But yes, there are still challenges imposed by the world on our ability to serve our Heavenly Father. The Father will reveal things that we do not know to us at his own time and as he sees fit. And to each one of us, he will give a portion to share with our brethren so we can finally release ourselves from the clutches of the enemy and enable us to know who we are most importantly and more than anything else to glorify our Heavenly Father who has done so much for us and has been so patient with us. The title of this video is Batu, Abatu and the Akoma. This is a special tribute to the Koma tradition itself, which is currently in progress, especially this November and December month in the entire country, Southern Africa, amongst the Botswana, amongst the Basotho, amongst the Amakosa, amongst the Amandebele, and many others who actually follow and take their male children of the right age to the Goma. And together, when we do this, we will restore our way of life which has been infiltrated and we will regain our inheritance of being kings and queens, a royal priesthood proclaimed by and for Ndade Mudimu. Yes, brothers and sisters, the scripture cannot be studied in any way but the way that the Father has taught us. And inasmuch as we all know that the scriptures have been tempered with immensely by the enemy, we however do know that the scriptures are to be studied in the following way. According to the Father in Isaiah 28 verse 10, for precept must be upon precept precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Further on, it is very clear that when we read here a little and there a little, we're not reading the Bible as if we're reading a novel or the books of the Bible as if we're reading the novel. The novel you can read from page one up to the last end. And the Father is also calling on us to rightly divide the word of truth, we must be able to discern what is indeed truth and look at our way of living as also part and parcel of that seeking the truth, including having to really go through the Spirit and the Father giving us and showing us the way. Otherwise, without all of that, we are not going to be able to find and discern the truth as the Father had directed us. Uh, brothers and sisters, before we can get into the full essence of the video, Bato Abantu and the Koma, let us first just take a look at what the apartheid regime knew that we as the Bantu did not know. Now I will look at the portfolio of the Minister of Law and Order during the racist apartheid regime period. And you will be able to really understand the depth and what it is that they knew that we didn't know. Flock, Adrian Flock that is, is the last minister of law and order of the racist apartheid regime under the de Klerk government. Now, the question that I want to have us raise in this particular slide is what did apartheid South Africa know that we as Abantu did not know? 
the significance of law and order. Okay, fine, we do know. Adrian Flock is now dead. I think he died early this year or last year, I don't know. In fact, I don't even care. However, as the last minister of law and order under the South African apartheid settler regime under the de Klerk government, whom the United Nations, by the way, uh, I'm, I'm saying United Nations so-called because they, they actually gave him a Nobel Peace Prize together with uh, Nelson Mandela. This is the point when I knew that the United Nations is nothing but just what our father said it is. If you look at Psalm 83, he tells us who they are. Now, if you look at what they have done, they have given credence to these two individuals, Nelson Mandela and the clerk. And we know the clerk is a nobody because he was in charge of the apartheid regime. He's been apologizing left, right and center uh, instead of just going to the father and, you know, repenting and, you know, asking for forgiveness from the father. He's been asking for forgiveness from our side which we don't have possession to give uh, or not to give. Now, if you look at Nelson Mandela, of course, if you want to understand the politics of South Africa, you will be able to understand the role that Nelson Mandela played, not the hype that you find in the media. What I will call on our brothers and sisters when you come to South Africa, when you go or you happen to go to Cape Town, just go to Robben Island and just identify one special thing that the waters, not the waters rather, but the former prisoners who are now giving lectures and uh, sharing their experiences in Robben Island. There is one person that has been hidden even from us as South Africans. We can't even go see where he was imprisoned, where he was kept and how he was kept. And that is Robert Sobugui. Now do that, do yourself a favor if you want to understand uh, South African politics better. Now let us go back to Adrian Flock. Adrian Flock was indeed a racist and he was the Minister of Law and Order under the racist apartheid regime under the clerk. Now when he got the Nobel Peace Prize together with Nelson Mandela, that is what I had said, was exactly just me having an appreciation of what the United Nations is, exactly what the Father said it is. If you look at Psalm 83, he tells us who they are. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, that is at verse 2, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head, they have taken crafty counsel against thy people, that is us, Abantu, and consulted against thy hidden ones. Us, Abantu, who have been hidden for so long, now we are coming out. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation. That is what they're trying to do every day, that the chosen people of Ntatemudimu may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent, that is, these so-called United Nations. They are confederate against thee, against us, Abantu. Giving the clerk a Nobel Peace Prize is indeed crafty counsel. It is best by the enemies of the chosen seed, Bana, by Beo. Them wanting us to believe they are ready for peace with the Bantu Abantu, south of the Sahara, and where all the Bantu Abantu of the world are gathering as per the prophecy of the Most High. The point I want to make with my reference to Adrian Flock is that there is indeed something that Afrikaners and the white Apartheid regime knew that we as Abantu, Batu, did not know or do not know that law and order, they go together and these cannot be separated. Yes, brothers and sisters, I've asked the question. What did the Apartheid settler white regime under the clerk what did they know that we as Abantu do not know or did not know? The answer to that question, brothers and sisters, the reason why they had a ministry of law and order, it is because they knew 
you cannot have order without law. The Afrikaners and the white apartheid regime knew that very well. That is why they were able to keep us in bondage under names such as Kafa and I know in the United States and in some other parts of the world, Negroes or nigger, whatever you know the by name is, but nevertheless it's still a by name. Uh, Kafa is a by name, and uh, that's why you know if you check your Deuteronomy uh, in 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 the book of Genesis, you will be able to see that the father talks about us that we are going to be given a by name. That was our by name in the southern part of Africa. If you go to Wikipedia, for example, it will tell you what this Minister of Law and Order did in order to maintain law and order. <clears throat> uh, if you read there, during his time as Deputy Minister of Law and Order, his ministry was responsible for the suppression and detention of around 30,000 people. In 1988, as Minister of Law and Order, he oversaw the restriction of 17 anti-apartheid organizations. Flock's position as minister became especially controversial after 1990 during the negotiations to end apartheid, with the African National Congress insisting on his dismissal. President F.W. de Klerk responded by moving him to a less controversial post as Minister of Correctional Services in July 1999. In 1999, of course, Flock was granted amnesty by the Lies and Lies Commission the sole cabinet minister to have admitted committing crimes, including the bombing of the headquarters of the South African Council of Churches at Khotso House and the Kosato Trade Union headquarters. So he apologized and therefore he gets to be forgiven. That is what our government of Nelson Mandela says. And now of course of Ramaphosa. Very sad. What you see here, brothers and sisters, is uh, our apartheid former minister of law and order. Walk, you can see him washing the feet of those he made to suffer, of those he tortured and thinking that this would redeem him. Since then, it reads, Flock has held tight to his title, towel and bow, a bowl, whatever you want to call it, washing the feet of a few other black men and women whom he wronged, his housekeeper, 10 black taxi drivers, and the mothers of 10 young anti-apartheid activists he killed. Flock was spared jail for the charge of attempting to murder Chikane in 2007 because of his apology at the TRC and his so-called display of remorse. So much for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission when people can do these things <clears throat> and get away with them. Yes, brothers and sisters. I just want to draw an analogy of Bantu understanding. And of course, I also want you to make your comments on this. This is the video of my brother, Tsiba Malonga of the Congo. Now, if you look at what he ultimately concludes in his video with regards to the Bantu language, Kikongo, you hear how he breaks down the word Congo so that people can understand the deep meaning of the Bantu words in general. Now, you will hear him talking about Koma. He talks about Koma in a particular way, though. But when I look at this video, and this video I have to say that I've been having it for the past few years now, and it is basically not in French as well, but it was indeed translated by Masia. 
so that we, the English audience, can be able to understand what he's saying in this video. Of course, you may find that Iba Malonga is sometimes not necessarily, you know, going in accordance with what you have learned as an awaken. But listen to him objectively. Because if you don't, you might be missing out on critical information on your survival and redemption. I want to continuously plead with brothers and sisters across the world to be cautious and to refrain and desist from being blind followers of anything or anybody. In my previous video, I have shared the need for us as the Abahantu not to be dead fish, because only dead fish go with the flow. Go on to prove all things and do your own research on things. Let us not do what we have been doing under Christian doctrines and principles. The so called pastors, and many of them fake, of course will read and will sing hymns and will go home and come again to church the next Sunday. Being the Awoken, especially being the Awoken Bantu, doesn't entail all such trash, but a commitment. A commitment to know yourself and be in a position to can glorify our Heavenly Father. Now, I want us to look at what, what Tsiba Malonga is basically saying in his video, especially with regards to this aspect around the Congo, what the Congo entails and what Oma is supposed to entail as well. And you will be able to see the analogy of what I'm trying to draw in so far as the Ministry of Law and Order under the apartheid regime the Oma itself, and what Tsiba Malonga is saying. If you look at what Tsiba is saying, Tsiba, of course, draws our attention to Yokana, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, which reads, in the beginning was, you know, the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was indeed God. Now, the question that I think we should ponder is, what is this Word? Um, and, and, of course, uh, some of it we know, but we never knew it in the way that Siba is putting it and the way that I'm going to try to show uh, in my video as to what the true nature of this coma is uh, in our everyday lives. In, in Yokana, the question is, what is this word? You know, Yokana 17, uh, 17 says, uh, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now, the word and truth are one and the same thing, according to uh, Yorkana 17, uh, 17. Um, and, and if you go further and, and try to really look at the true content of this truth, uh, you go to Psalm 119, um, you know, verse 142. Uh, and this, of course, we, we, we know uh, from, you know, um, the engagements that we've had as the Bantu and uh, Abantu in general, when we study the Bible, uh, you know, uh, uh, precept upon precept uh, methodology. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. So the law is the truth. Now, if you read Yokana chapter 1, verse 1, the conclusion by Tsiba Malonga is that in the beginning it was divine order. Right? And this divine order was basically God's creation. And we'll get to it more in this coming slide. That is why then, brothers and sisters, that Ziba, in his conclusion, is able to make the statement that says, in the beginning was divine order, meaning the word. The word is Goma, and we will prove it to you. That's what he says. So go watch the video and listen to what he says and have better understanding. The point that I wanted to drive home is that 
order and the law, they go hand in glove, always together. That is what the apartheid regime knew. And this brings me, you know, to come to think of it, to say that, but where do they get it? Where would they get this? Because it's not necessarily glaringly and clearly stipulated and portrayed in the Bible or in the different books that make up the Bible. Is it, is it maybe not that they have our books, our, 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 our scripts, and uh, they, they, they take what they need and use and then hide it again and put it back into the shelf? You know, it, it, makes, it makes one think. But anyway, let me uh, leave that thought because I digress. This law is our law. Because the law is meant to be our way of life. As the Father's chosen seed, the Father's banner, the babe, the Father repeatedly assures us that the wearers of the kingly gear should find significance of his laws. This is what the Father says. But you are a chosen people, a holy nation, the most high special possession. The Father goes on to say this. The Lord, which is the most high, has sworn and will not repent. You are a priest forever. After the order of Melchizedek, the Father goes on to say, You are a holy people to the Most High, your Father, has chosen you to be a special people to Himself. This is the Father talking about us, reassuring us of who we are. Yes, brothers and sisters, the law goes together with order. Currently, we have so much disorder because there's no law. And the Father says in John chapter 8, verse 32, your God, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. We are not free <clears throat> as we speak right now because we don't know the truth and we think that truth is something that is out there. The truth is what the Father has been telling us it is. The laws, statutes and commandments that he has given us. And if you look at those statutes and commandments, there's nothing funny or unique about them. They just say what we actually even portraying as being moralist or a moralist agenda or moralist perspective of human nature. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not steal. Now, if the law has been done away with, then it means let us steal, let us murder each other. That, that's what's happening now. Because nobody wants to go by the law. And the Father says, yeah, the law will definitely make you free. But, of course, because you are a stiff-necked people, we refuse to accept that. 
Okay, once again, brothers and sisters, first and foremost, we have been able to appreciate that the Africana white settler regime in Southern Africa, they knew the significance of having law and order going together, because without order, I mean, without law, there will never be order. Now, Siba has also been able to touch on this law and this order being what he refers to as coma, because that's basically the conclusion he makes in his video. Now, I am drawing your attention then to the actual title of the video, which is Batu, Abantu and the Koma itself. What do the Abantu, Batu have to say? What is this truth, which is the law? Let's answer that question. Brothers and sisters, um, I was very fascinated by the work that has already been done by my brother, Tsiba Malonga, in his video that I've made reference to. And for me, being familiar with the word coma and knowing what it entails, one could be able to find the very same content and significance of coma between what I was working on in so far as this particular video is concerned and what my brother Tsiba was working on in so far as the analysis and the breakdown of Pongo and coma. But the bottom line for him was the fact that it's all about the law. It's all about order. And when you look at coma from within the context of being Bantu person from the southern part of Africa, one appreciates and understands fully what it is that he is sharing. Now, I wanted to get deeper into the word coma and what really the Sesotho understanding is. And I think when you look at Sesotho as a language, you must not divorce it from Sipedi or Setswana because they are the same dialects or they are within the same range as one language being divided as per the seeking of land and better pastures for our livestock. Now, when I go into the Sotho vocabulary, it's called the English Sesotho vocabulary. You will find it in the internet. When you go to page 310, you see there truth. Truth entails nete, which is, you know, the truth, the synonym for nete, but importantly, the truth is actually goma. This is exactly what Tsiba Malonga was talking about. This is exactly what the Basotho, the Botswana, and the Batebili talk about when they talk about goma. Goma refers to that process which entails the teaching of the law. Now, if you look at truth, if you look at, of course, Psalm 119142, thy law is the truth. And it is also said in Yokana, chapter 8, verse 32 or 30, if I'm not wrong. Thou shalt know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. 
Now, this truth and coma are one and the same thing, but where do we find coma within the Southern African context? That is what I'm sharing, brothers and sisters. In the Southern African context, coma cannot entail anything else but what I've shared with you. Going through the rite of passage, moving from being a boy and going into being a man. And it's usually the young boys around 13 years of age and 20 years of age who go through that rite of passage. But if you've missed it, just like Abraham, you know, missed it in a way, you can do it at any age. And that is what is the practice in the southern part of Africa. Of course, we cannot say much about what happens there because most of the things that are happening there are supposed to be taught there and left there. It's only when you go back to teach others the same that you have learned that you can be in a position to share, but to share, you know, everywhere else will be unlawful. And it goes with sanctions from the Bantu, the Batu, when that happens. Now here, brothers and sisters, you can see clearly for yourselves Banabapil coming from initiation school from Kome. That is why when they say Ketwa Kome, it means I've gone to fetch the law. That is why when our parents, our grandmothers and our grandfathers say we don't have the law. That is what they mean. We didn't go. The Goma. The Basutu do it. The Babidi do it. The Amakosa do it. And if you can see these Akosa young men coming out after Goma. The same word can still also be associated with Ingo by Ahmad Hoss. I don't want to dwell too much on their rites of passage because I don't know how they do them. I see uh, when I go to Cape Town and, you know, I am in the company of my friends, but there's not much because a lot is hidden. But about the Abasotu, I can attest to it because I'm from there. I also went through this particular exercise. Kea Atwa Kumeng. Now, Atwa Kumeng, there are secrets that you cannot be able to share. Be that as it may, what I'm sharing is purely what I want my brothers and sisters to appreciate. That form is indeed the law. The law is indeed the truth. That truth is indeed what is going to set us free from where we are, who we are, and realize our true potential as given to us by our Father. Clearly then, brothers and sisters, Koma is synonymous with the law. Now, the law or the receiving of the law entails a lot of teachings, a lot of appreciation of what your order is supposed to be. Now, without the law, there will be no order amongst the children of the Most High. Circumcision being part and parcel of Goma clearly is therefore a manifestation of being Mutu. The circumcision that is referred to in Genesis 17.7 is part and parcel of that Goma. We cannot be selective on how we want to be Batu, Abantu, but we should embrace our being Abantu as is. 
we should also desist as much as we can from vilifying things we do not know and have no clue about. Yes, the Father will reveal to us in time all that we need to know. But we should not view ourselves as know-it-alls. Coming from the southern part of Southern Africa, of Africa, rather, we practice going to Oma as a place where we're going to be taught the law. Now, of course, we know that the law and the teachings of the law, when we go for Oma, are not what it used to be because it has been interfered with just like everything that Batu does being interfered with and tempered with. In Genesis 17, 7, the Father says, I am establishing my covenant between me and you along with your descendants after you generation after generation as an everlasting covenant to be dear for you and your descendants after you. Now, this is an everlasting law. It's, it's not, doesn't have a period. Secondly, the Father says, now, Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the very same day, Abram was circumcised and Ishmael, his son. Now, that is very familiar with what happens in the southern part of Africa. Amongst the Basotho, amongst the Amatrosa, amongst the Amandebel, those that I know of. But that's basically how it is being done. before and I'm consistently saying it that we need to know the laws that the Father has given to us let's study them and ask him for his guidance on how we need to observe those particular laws once again listen to what the Father is saying with regards to his laws Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing is, if you obey the commandments of the Most High, your Father, which I command you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Father, but turn aside from the way which I command you today, to go after other gods which you have not known. This you will find in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26 to 28. The Father goes on further again, emphasizing the need for us to know what the law is and the need for us to really indeed observe those laws. The Father says in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear Mudimu and keep his commandments, for this is why we are human beings. That's the whole duty of our being. Father further says in Exodus chapter 15 verse 26, if you diligently heed the voice of the Most High your Father and do what is right in his sight, give ear to Mudimu's commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Most High who heals you. What more then, brothers and sisters, do we need or want to be convinced that indeed this is what the Father says? You see, the problem that we have, which is what we have been taught by the Catholic Church and Christian religion, is that, look, what the Father says, just do the opposite. The Father says, law, law, law. We say the law has been done away with in our actions, our conduct, and the way we do things. 
These commandments, brothers and sisters, are our order. These commandments are our coma. And I can tell you, brothers and sisters, coma, molao, are synonymous. Because even some of the coma that we sing confirm molao, coma, as one and the same thing. Yeah, brothers and sisters. Second Maccabees, Maccaba, chapter 7, teaches us the lengths that the adversary of the Most High will go in order to ensure that the obedience of the commandments by the Bantu does not happen. And if it does happen, to have it skewed and misrepresented. Brothers and sisters, I put it to you that it is not only pig's meat as portrayed in chapter 7, where we were forced to eat against the Father's law. It has been the tradition of our forefathers not to eat pork and to go to coma at the right age to be taught the law. The adversary has not kept his hands clean in the way the coma is being managed and administered. But that is one of the things that is bound to men who have gone through the process should seek to protect and revive it in accordance with the will of our forefathers and the will of our Heavenly Father. It is never beyond imagination what the adversary is prepared to do. Now, when you read 2 Maccabees chapter 7, on another occasion, a Bantu mother and her seven sons were arrested. The king was having them beaten to force them to eat pork, contrary to the law. Then one of the young men said, what do you hope to gain by doing this? We would rather die than abandon the traditions of our fathers. This made the king so furious that he gave orders for huge pans and kettles to be heated red hot, and this was done immediately. Then he told his men to cut off the tongue of the one who had spoken, and to scalp him, and to chop off his hands and feet, while his mother and six brothers looked on. After the young man had been reduced to a helpless mass of breathing flesh, the king gave orders for him to be carried over and thrown into one of the pans. As a cloud of smoke steamed up from the pan, the brothers and their mother encouraged one another to die bravely, saying, Modimu is looking on and understands our suffering. Moshe made this clear when he wrote a song condemning those who had abandoned the father, he said. The father will have mercy on those who serve him. This is the length at which our forefathers went in order to protect our heritage so that we don't lose the inheritance. Brothers and sisters, I plead with you. Observe the Father's commandments and don't lose the inheritance. Stay focused, stay alive, and indeed, pick your mental. And as the Botswana Bantu would say, Bula, Nala, Bula, which is rain, and Nala, which is prosperity, is what we always say in our conversations as the Bantu Botswana. Bula, Aene, Bula, let it rain. Thank you so much until next time.